All righty. Howdy, everyone, and welcome to our virtual event, Youth in Action, Diving into Biodiversity. My name is Armand Alex, and I'm an undergraduate student at Texas A&M University of Corpus Christi, and also a member of Earth Echo International's Youth Leadership Council. And uh, of course, I'm so excited to be here to host this event alongside our partners at Scientists in Every Florida School. Uh, so dive in with me as we learn about invertebrates, the most biodiverse uh, groups on Earth, as we speak with Jackson uh, on his research and marine invertebrates, and of course, the importance of biodiversity. And I also, of course, wanted to uh, thank Scientists in Every Florida School. And uh, this is a free program with a mission to engage Florida K-12 students and teachers in cutting edge research by providing science role models and experiences that inspire the future stewards of our planet. And of course, we encourage you to check out all of these programs and opportunities available uh, and to include how to request a scientist to visit your classroom if that's something that you're interested in. We especially want to thank Earth Echo International, which is a global nonprofit founded on the belief that youth have the power to change our planet. Reaching more than 2 million people in, over, in just about 146 countries, uh, we provide original content, immersive experiences, and trusted resources to empower young people just like myself and Jackson to become leaders and problem solvers in their communities and around the world. Now, for my favorite part, and without further ado, let's get started by introducing our expert today, Jackson Powell. Jackson, how's it going, buddy? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and where are you coming from? Hi there. I'm glad to be here. My name is Jackson Powell. Um, quick question. Can everyone hear me? All good on this side. All right. Excellent. So my name is Jackson Powell. I'm a PhD student at Florida State University getting my degree in biological science. In particular, I'm focused in the ecology and evolution group. So um, I'm actually here at FSU in Tallahassee in my lab actually right now. So um, I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jackson, and especially from your lab. Um, now I have a, a series of questions for you. And um, as we kind of have this ongoing conversation to do today's virtual event, I'll be sure to ask some questions coming in from even our live audience. So if you are a live audience today, um, we've uh, got that opportunity for you to comment. I'll be able to see some of those questions. So if you have a question for Jackson, go ahead and pop that in the chat and I'll make sure to read it and we can go ahead and see what his response is. Um, now, so let's get started with our first question, Jackson. What is it that you do for a living? Well, I'm actually I'm actually a lot of things for a living. Um, it's an interesting question because officially I consider myself to be a marine biologist. But within marine biology, you do a lot of different things. Currently, I'm actually a student within marine biology, but that does not take away from any of the sort of research that I do as a marine biologist. Um, so I'll do anything from teaching, from um, research to obviously diving. Many of you have seen the pictures I put up. Um, you know, in the thumbnail and on Twitter, I do quite a few things. Basically, anything you can imagine a student, a biologist, um, a scientist, um, a friend <laughs> would do is the sort of thing that I would do. All righty. I appreciate the diving photos, by the way. I haven't been able to go yet, but uh, the closest I've got is snorkeling. <laughs> so I definitely appreciate some. Uh, some diving pictures, but uh, we've also included a quick video of you as well. And I'd love to be able to show that. See if we can pop that up real quickly, just so our audience can watch it. It's one of my favorites. All righty, let's see. I believe there's supposed to be some audio with this video. So Let's see if we're going to be able to get that audio playing and give this uh, this video some justice. <laughs> it deserves to be seen. In and there. hold on one second while we go ahead and troubleshoot that. I think we might be there. You want to give that another shot of replaying? here at FSU. I'm in the Ecology and Evolution group. My research focuses on how multiple life stages of marine invertebrates can slow down or potentially increase the rate of adaptive evolution 
the face of climate change. When I used to live in Maryland, they took us to the to the National Marine Aquarium in Baltimore. And it was the first time I really saw anything in the ocean that was not a fish. I didn't really understand, you know, I was probably six or seven years old, that crabs and other little critters came from the ocean. So I thought the marine invertebrates were very cool. I remember my brother and I asked one of the, uh, the, one of the aquarists there, what sort of job you'd have to have had in order to work on the sorts of animals. And they told us, you need to become a marine, a marine biologist. And so me and my brother both decided to go and try to become a marine biologist. And I just kept going with it. It fell off a little bit when I was, when I moved to California. But in sixth grade, we went to a field trip and we went to this lab on the coast and after we were studying jellyfish life cycles. And pretty much it got reignited within me that spark to pursue marine biology after I moved out there. Going through um, science as a black male, I look around and it's very easy to see there aren't very many of us that are in these fields. And when you actually look at media and look at what's presented to us, there's not that many role models that we can have. And so part of me really wanted to get the PhD because I actually wanted to pretty much become that black professor that I never had. Not just that, I like research. I really love research. I like to see how we can actually go out there and contribute to the world in some way with some sort of data or challenge long-standing paradigms, see if they actually hold up to what we know now versus what was held maybe a few decades ago. And it's a nice feeling to know that you actually have the power to go forward and do that and leave a mark. Currently, I don't think I have uh, one career in mind. I view my trajectory based on my goals. And my goals pretty much boil down to becoming a role model for other minorities to show that they too can work hard enough to actually get into a field that society doesn't really let us know that we can be in. I want to be there to tell them that here, you know, hey, here's how you figure that out. Here is um, the sorts of things that you can get involved with, even if you don't get into these sorts of programs where you can volunteer, how you can up your, um, your research acumen, even if you are not in some sort of program. I don't think that my research is very focused on teaching. Obviously, it's not, I'm not in a science education degree, but my research being that it is, it's very evolution based and a lot of Americans still have problems with understanding evolution or think that evolution is for a certain demographic of people to believe in. I think that is very good because it opens up the opportunity for me to clear some discrepancies regarding how people view or think about evolution. You know, a lot of people still think it's just survival of the fittest, and there's so much more to it that they don't realize is even affecting human populations to this day. So my days vary quite a bit. I work down in the FSU Marine Lab, and sometimes my days could be me going out on a boat, going out scuba diving, um, and doing research with my advisor or other grad students to help them out. That could also include just me going down to the marine lab and snorkeling around for the species that I work on, taking them back to the lab and doing dissections. And the dissections for my animal requires me to do it, unfortunately, at like 7 to 10 p.m. And that could be a longer sort of day. I might go out to the field, boat out there, snorkel around for my animals, come back to the lab, wait a few hours and do my dissections and fertilizations later on that night come back in the morning and I could find larvae that I can work on. Sometimes it becomes difficult to figure out what is an accomplishment when everyone around you in your normal workplace does the same things. And I like to remind myself what I was feeling when I decided I was going to go to Florida State and get my PhD in biological sciences. What I'm trying to do hasn't been done before because it's hard. Otherwise, people would have done it a long time ago. And so I'm willing to make the sacrifices and work this hard, knowing that I'll be one step closer to making the world the sort of place that I would like to see. Wow, what, a, what an incredible video. Thank you so much for providing that, Jackson.
Um, and already, just watching that video, our comment section exploded with a bunch of different questions. And I've got two main ones for you. Um, they were completely perplexed at the, the section of you dissecting. Uh, could you remind us about the specimen that you're dissecting and, and exactly what were you doing? Because they are thrilled. So I actually do a lot of dissections on um, an animal that's called a, uh, a tunicate. So some of you may have heard of a sea squirt before, and it's basically the same thing. And I will dissect them because I want to um, extract um, sperm and eggs out of them. And that requires um, dissections. So I do, I've dissected so many of them. I've dissected oysters. I've dissected um, multiple species of the Cidians. Um, in a way, I've dissected some of the animals that I'm going to show you today that I have alive, not dissected yet. Um, <laughs> so that's usually where my dissections take place and how um, it goes with those. And I, I also think that this is some of the, the funnest parts in the lab is whenever you, you understand the anatomy of a specific organism and then you get to, of course, di dissect it and, and identify those specific parts. Um, now, another question before we move on to our bigger ones is um, they all would like to know what is, or Annabelle from our comment section wants to know, what does a PhD mean? What does it stand for? A PhD? Well, officially a PhD stands for Doctor of Philosophy, but it doesn't mean that you're getting a doctorate of philosophy. It basically means it is one of the highest levels of education that you can achieve. It's like a degree, like a bachelor's or a master's um within a certain field and um i actually don't know the history behind why they call it a phd like i do also don't know why they call a bachelor's a bachelor's or a master's a master's but basically it's um it's it's a level of um education that you get so at the end of this i will be a phd of biological science all righty thank you so much jackson for the clarification and thank you annabelle for answering that awesome uh for asking that awesome question now, uh, moving on to some of our bigger questions, the first one, because um, that video just hit about every good spot, but out of all the experiences you've had, what is one of the coolest things that you've done as a part of your work? Well, I would say Morea. So in the next slide, we'd actually show some of these pictures. So in 2019, in the summer, I went along with um, my advisor and some other um, researchers to Morea, which is an island out in the South Pacific to do research with the coral. Like I said in that video, um, I personally don't do scuba for my own research, but because of my skills, I am, um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a commodity. Like people want me to go with them because it's, you know, it's, it's, I have a certain skill set that, um, that, that um, is very useful for others who actually do do this sort of stuff for research. And um, so we can go to the next slide. So we actually worked at this lab. Um, this is actually owned through the UC system, I believe. I think it's UC, mostly UC Santa Barbara students, but I think its history lies with um, a lot with UC Berkeley, uh, which is a, you know, universities out of California in right. the same school system as, U, as UCLA. Um, and so in the next, we can go to the next slide. Um, so I really wanted to show this because I personally didn't know where Morea was, but this is a map of what Morea looks like. Some of you may recognize um, that island up in the top left, Bora Bora, and that large um, island right there that says French Polynesia, that's actually Tahiti. So it's, you may have heard of those before, but Morea is an island that isn't as popular as those as a tourist destination, but it is very popular for research. And because it's in the South Pacific, and um, I think that it's very important that we know where this is. We can go to the next slide. This is where um, Morea is. So you see, it's halfway across the world. Um, so I'm in Tallahassee. And um, so you can actually, I actually left the distance down there. So this is 5,500 miles away is where um, I flew to do this research. Wow. So, <clears throat> Far from home. <laughs> Now, when you're when you're over there, Jackson, you, I'm assuming you're able to do some snorkeling, right? Definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, we did snorkel, we did diving. I think if you go to the next slide, I actually have a picture of that. Um, so here is um, here here are the research that I went with my advisor, and um, actually now the postdoc in the lab where, that I work in. Um, you can see it's gearing up for a for a trip. You see me on the right over there. I'm actually putting on my snorkel right now because I have to swim down about. 
um, 15 to 20 feet in order to unhook the boat from a mooring line. And that's not on scuba. So I actually just use that with snorkel. Um, I saw a question about sharks too. And um, I actually do have some information on that that you'll hear about um, later on. Gotcha. So yeah, so you see here's, here's actually a picture of, um, of me diving with my advisor on the coral reef where we are um, sampling for corals. You see there my advisor's clip, taking a clipping off and I'm um, collecting those clippings with him. So um, we see a lot of animals there. You can see in the bottom right, there's a little fishy right there. Unfortunately, the coral reefs have been losing a lot of biodiversity over the years. So they're not as vibrant as some of the old pictures and videos may suggest. But um, there are some things that I did see. If you go to the next slide, I should have a picture of, uh, of a shark that I saw. So I know that, you know, oftentimes when I'm diving, people ask me questions about, oh, man, did you see any sharks? Um, have you ever been chased by one? And I can't say I've been chased by them before, but I did see this species. It's called a black tip reef shark. And it actually um, it's actually a pretty docile and timid species. So you can often see them about 50, 60 feet away, circling around, just curious about what is that weird fish that keeps bubbling and has all these weird limbs and no fins. <laughs> so um, sometimes they take a look. And there was one time when they actually did get pretty close, like within 15 feet of me, um, when I was actually swimming down to unhook the boat from a mooring line so we can um, go back to the go back to land. What an experience. Wow. <laughs> you said 15, 20 feet away from you? Um, yeah, it was actually there's actually two of them that swam towards me. And I think it's because I was flailing a little bit. They might have thought like, oh, what's going on? Is this a dying animal? But then I, I looked at them and they saw that I was alive and they freaked out and they swam away real quick. And I'm assuming that you were able to see, you know, a, a lot of, of other things than just sharks. Can you talk to just a little bit about what that biodiversity around the area looked like? Yes. So, um, so if you actually go back to the um, to the pictures of us diving on the coral reef, there's actually, you know, it's actually um, it's actually deceptive. What you're seeing here may look just like a bunch of rocks and a bunch of weirdness, but there are several different species of coral here. And, um, you know, these coral all are from different genuses or if they're within the same genus, they could look exactly the same, but be, but be very different species, which is one of the reasons why we uh, went there to do this research. And um, you can see that if you look real closely, there's differences in the color. Like you see a little bit of pink over here. You see a little bit of white over there. This one's brown, but that was not as dark brown. Underwater, some of these, some of these um, pictures can look a little bit weird, but the colors can be a lot more vibrant if you have the right sort of photography set up and such. So there is a lot of biodiversity within this very picture. Now I don't study coral myself, so I can't tell you just how much there is, but I know there's at you know there there's definitely several different species here right. that we were looking at. Different species, different types, different textures and shapes and colors. Corals are biodiverse in their own. And you know, speaking of biodiversity, this leads us into our next big question is, you know, for a lot of people, they don't necessarily know what biodiversity is. So what is biodiversity and, and what does it mean to you, Jackson? So biodiversity is actually very interesting. Um, biodiversity, depending on who you ask, can change um, in its scope. And I think a very broad definition of that is um, the variance in some aspect of life. Um, I think in a very broad sense, we usually think of biodiversity as in diversity of species. We think about how there's a tiger here, there's a lion over there, there's an elephant over here. There are you know, several different um, things. And I think I have a definition in the next slide that I think um, that I kind of basically stole from, from Google to kind of get at that. And I do actually have a few examples of what I mean by the scope, um, the scope um, affecting your question. So I actually have a an app, um, a creature right here. I don't want to say what it is. You know, <laughs> if you're to look at this, right? Many of us, if I were to ask you a question, you don't have to answer. Is this a plant? Is it an animal? Is it a fungus? A lot of us would be a little bit confused about how we'd answer that. And um, I just want you to look at this, think about how you would try to define what it is. And then in the next slide, I actually have a picture of what it looks like under the microscope. And you can ask yourself if that will change your answer. 
to see if it to see what it looks like at this level. And the answer to this is that it's an animal. But for a lot of people, um, they'll think that it might be a plant until we inform them about what's going on here. Um, there's a lot of different body forms. Um, there's a lot of different looks. There's a lot of different life cycles. There's a lot of different um, ways that life will manifest on Earth. And I think that that really gets at biodiversity. And I use this as an example because most of the time people think it's a plant and it's not. It's an animal. So, wow. <clears throat> yeah. So I think that if we um, go to the next slides, um, that I should have some examples of exactly what I mean by um, by by diversity. You know, we often think of it as you know variety in life, and we often think of biodiversity at a community level, like in this. Um, in this sense, where we look and we see a bunch of different organisms, but within and and among different um, types of organisms, you can see quite a deal of variation. So we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so like I said, we usually think of it like this. We think about this sort of diversity within a community, mm. but it doesn't just end there. So we can go next. Um, like I said, some um, organisms, some levels of biodiversity have to do with the fact that there could be diversity in how in the life cycle of an animal. Within a lot of sharks, we have animals that are, um, you know, who give live birth. Some lay eggs. Some um, have, you know, will have like broods of eggs, you know, being born in, within their bodies. Some animals aren't exactly just male and female. They are um, hermaphroditic, where they can um, perform both roles. A lot of fish will start off um, as a male or a female and then sh switch to the other later on in life. There's a lot of different things out there, and I think that that is, that is what biodiversity highlights. Wow, I, I immediately think of biodiversity with jellyfish, and of course you've got different types of jellies, and mm -hmm. you know what makes up a true jelly, what doesn't. You know, I think of siphonophores, where it's different colonies, uh, you know, and they're quote unquote jellies. So that's amazing. Thank you so much. I know we have a couple of uh, slides on, on your biodiversity topic. Um, yes. Right? Maybe yes. Think to some, some, some shells. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so in biodiversity, you know, here's examples of animals that I personally worked on. These are the animals that I've dissected for my research before. Um, you can find within different groups that there's variation. So these two animals are the sea squirts that I worked on, and they're part of the same genus, Mogula occidentalis and Mogula manhattensis, but you see they look very different, and they have different um, life cycles. Um, one lives in the sand, and one lives hanging on things or living in the mud, and this is within a genus. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And even within species, you can get quite a deal of um, variation. So we can, if we go to the next slide, I should have some examples of um, exactly what I mean by that. So you see here that we have um, that we have tons of shells and these shells are all from the same species of snails, but you see there's so much difference between them. And I actually have some animals that my uh, my, my lab mate Alex Hooks actually works on called the Florida crown conch. Um, and you can see that I have two specimens here. And if you look really closely, um, despite the fact that they are the same species, right. the spikes around the ridge of them look very different between the two of them. So within the same species, you can get quite a deal of variation. And that's actually um, where evolutionary um, biologists, such as myself, are very interested. And here's actually another picture of um, some biodiversity. Here's, our, here's the product of my dissections. When I take the eggs out of um, an animal, um, you'll see that the eggs are at different stages of development. Some um, have only divided into two cells. Some of them have divided into four cells. Some of them are balls of cells, and some of them have already started growing tails that they'll use when they'll hatch. So you can see that even within a family um, or even within a single generation, there can be tons of variation um, that is important to consider. And I, I just have a quick question for you, uh, Jackson. Some of these shells that, you know, of course, within the species, they've got a little bit of differences. Would you would those be like mutations? 
Well, um, those can be caused by several different things. So um, we're often taught that your phenotype, basically what makes you look like you, um, is going to be affected by your genetics. That's not um, on. That's not. That's not an unknown topic, or a hard to understand concept. However, um, there are several different other things, other factors that can influence your phenotype and what you look like. That could be some sort of. That could be environment. You could grow up in a certain environment where um, where things are not conducive to you growing a certain way. And a lot of snails, they'll actually grow spikes on their body if they're around a lot of predators. Mm -hmm. But if they're on their own, um, they wouldn't grow them. Um, the, the mother's experience uh, means a lot too. Oftentimes we hear about pregnant women have to have a very good diet. They need to be on prenatals, uh, make sure they don't go on roller coasters or up into space or doing backflips because it's very important that despite the genes or the genetics of the of the child, that um, you know her experience is going to affect the offspring, and the same happens within nature with a lot of animals and plants and pretty much anything else right. that will give birth. That brings into the topic of nurture, you know, versus nature, and then of course, you know, you're also you're a product of your environment kind of ideal. So thanks for clarifying that, Dex. Right. Um, I think I saw a question about sperm and eggs. Um, why yes. can I get them from the environment? Well, actually, um, within the ocean environment, they have a lot of animals that will just squirt their sperm and eggs out into the water column. They'll just squirt it out there and hope somehow they meet. But because it's in the ocean, it can be very difficult to find these things. Um, these, egg, these pictures of eggs that I showed you are very small, and the sperm are even smaller. So it's very difficult for me to find the right amounts that I need from the field to do my research. And I chose um, the Ascidians for this research because they they are very easy to dissect. Um, their sperm and eggs are, ve are very um, easy to identify. They actually do very well in the lab when it comes to fertilization and to make babies. They're just a stellar species to work with, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think of the, <laughs> the ocean as a big soup. I mean, you might be you know searching for some pepper, but you might pick up some paprika in a sample and that's right. you're not looking for paprika, you know? <laughs> Right. It'd be like if I stuck my hand into a mound of dirt looking for worms alone and I'd bring up everything else that comes with it. Gotcha. Uh, oh, I love this question that popped up. It's, yeah. you know, uh, looking at sea squirts, what is their typical lifespan? How long do they usually live? I actually do not know how long they live. Um, I don't imagine that they live anything longer than two years of the species that I work with. Um, I mostly, I mostly understand how long it takes for them to metamorphose. So like frogs, um, they will actually have a little tadpole that comes out that swims around. And then um, after about 80 hours, they will um, turn into basically a miniaturized adult that looks just like the, the thing that I showed you at the beginning, the big round one that was brown, except it's smaller hmm. and clear until it has, um, until it's grown up. <laughs> Learning life cycles of different organisms is, is really uh, unique and, and special to me, especially with jellyfish. I think that um, they've got a definite unique lifespan or, you know, life cycle stages that they go through. And I think that scientists are paying more attention to the small scale variations. And I believe some of your work has to do with that as well, Jackson. Um, yes. Could you talk to us a little bit about, you know, why does, you know, variants at you know, smaller scales, whether it be you know, DNA or however you would speak. Um, why, why do those kind of variances matter? So, um, yeah, it, it, it's a common question. Um, in, the, in the slides that were up, I actually had um, a picture of, a, of some of the coral that were where we were when we were diving. And, you know, one of the reasons why this is important is because at the very small scale, to the point where you can't see very clear differences among species. Like I have, um, like this animal that I have here, right? This is called a bryozoan. And a bryozoan could look like this. And they call it bryozoans because they call it, it stands for moss animal, bryo, moss, zoan animal. But they could also look like this. Um, let me make sure I'm bringing this in. They could look like this, and they could look like this. There's quite a, amount of, a lot of variation between them. They're different species, but there's there's so much variation, even though they're technically the same animal and the sort of things that make them um, similar to each other may not be um, immediately apparent. In the picture of the coral that I have there, I put that there because 
the coral reef that we went on actually has a lot of species that look exactly the same. And it's important because historically, um, you know, conservation efforts have been made to protect a lot of these species. But unfortunately, um, what actually looks like one species could be five different species of people, which is one of the reasons why you need stuff like genetics, which is in a way one of the smallest scales that you can work on. Um, so you can't elucidate some of these things unless you actually look at the genetics. Right. And um, since genetics are important for evolution, which I will um, discuss later on, it's very important to consider. Right. And I, I know you have a couple of uh, quick more slides, and then I also want to make sure that we're uh, cognizant of the time because you've got some good right. information here. I want to make sure to fit it all in. Um, Definitely. Let's let's take a look at that next slide we have coming up. Uh, could you going to be looking at here? Um, it's still on the topic of you know small scale variations. Right. Uh, here we go. Right. So I would just say I wanted to um, talk about evolution here because. Um, Oftentimes we're taught that evolution is a long-term process, right? We're taught that evolution is going to make gradual changes over time, but that's not actually what the definition for evolution is. Evolution is simply put um, the change in allele frequency over time. But that basically means within a single generation, evolution has occurred. It's taken place. You might not be aware of what it might have happened, but evolution has happened across a generation and there actually are some examples that we have here of short-term evolution it doesn't take 65 million years for you to see effects mm -hmm. here in here in africa we actually have a lot of um these fish caught caught um was it cichlids or cichlids i'm not a i'm not a fish person but i just i always read about it but i never really hear it but i think it's pronounced cichlids and basically with the cichlids is that um they have invaded these um these different lakes within Africa and had very rapid evolution. If you progress to the slide, I actually highlighted those in Lake Victoria. And those in Lake Victoria um, saw the largest increase in the number of species within the last 15,000 to 100,000 years. The modern human being has been thought to be around for um, 200,000 to 300,000 years, like in this form that we have. And so most of these species didn't even exist before humans did. Mm. These things came about after human beings are in the current form that we have here. Right. And this is called an adaptive radiation where they adapt to many different, uh, to fulfill many different roles within the environment. And we actually can see these sorts of things. We've caused these sorts of things in the lab. It doesn't take a very long time to, um, to have this happen. And in order to understand how fast it might happen, um, it helps to have the genetic information. Right. And, you know, these types of variations that we're seeing on a small scale, um, you know, within you know shorter amounts of time than we usually think, um, this is all, you know, forms of biodiversity, ch yeah. changes in life, the differences that we have um, amongst species. And, you know, biodiversity is important because, of course, it shows that we can be resilient to change. More biodiversity means, you know, it's better for our planet. Um, but unfortunately, we know that there are a lot of uh, threats to biodiversity, whether it's man-made or if it's, you know, coming from nature around itself. Um, but could you talk to us about what are some uh, threats uh, that, that biodiverse has to face? Well, the biggest one is climate change. That is a given. Climate change is a huge, is a huge um, danger to biodiversity and not just to biodiversity within nature, but to us as human beings. Right. Um, you'll see that um, you know, increase, that lowering pH and increasing temperatures can affect a lot of stuff. And it's not just to say global warming is um, a product of this. Um, climate events like the um, her like increases in storms, increases in hurricanes, more cold snaps, more highs and lows for extreme um, climate events are more likely to occur with um, climate change. And I don't, I don't need to go into the um, atmospheric science behind why that is, but basically that's a huge effect. And also um, habitat destruction. That is a much more easy to understand direct effect. And I have a few slides on that. Um, in particular, I have two examples of what I mean by this. Um, overfishing is one of them. Um, it's basically under unsustainable use of ocean resources. 90% of all large predatory fish are gone. It is just really important because the largest fish produce the most babies. And if you usually eat all those, 
it's hard for them to replenish themselves within the environment. There's also deforestation, and um, deforestation is really good, really big. We might have heard about this a little bit more. And in particular, it affects um, you know below the um, equator, like South America, Africa, South Asia, where they uh, will convert land um, to non-forest use. And they kind of try to hide this sometimes too. If you go to the next slide, I have an example of what they do. Um, you can go to the next one. You can see that even in the United States, they have deforested um, a lot of, of area. And what they'll actually do is that they know that it does not, it's not a good look. So they will actually sometimes leave um, some trees just along the major roads. So they make sure they don't give off a bad look for uh, what's happening. It's actually kind of depressing, but um, these are huge impacts, especially since trees absorb most of the carbon dioxide as, long, as well as the ocean. And you know, that goes into the air and converts it into stuff that we can use and that animals could use. And carbon dioxide is not good for, I mean, increased carbon dioxide emissions is not good for climate change. And so it, com it kind of like works in with itself. The more habitat destruction we do, the more climate change um, Exponential right? impact we have. Yeah, it's like a circular thing. It's like, yeah, you know, they're going to definitely um, contribute to climate change by habitat destruction. You know, I, that picture that we saw with the trees along the road, I don't think I've ever seen something um, to that degree of hiding what's, uh, you know, some of those things that we are causing, whether it be de deforestation or adding more gases into our atmosphere. But oh my gosh. Um, I was going to say, Jackson, moving uh, moving forward, um, you as a scientist, you're a human being, we love to hear stories from, from real scientists, whether it's about your research or about your personal overcomings. Um, so as a scientist, you know, as a student, as a young man, you know, what are some of the hardships that you've had to overcome and, and how did you do that, really? Yes. So I actually have, um, I actually have a few unique hardships, I think. Um, we go to the next slide. Um, I actually was a student athlete throughout um, all of high school and through a good amount of college. I ran track and field and, um, you know, that took a lot of time. And one of the reasons why I did track and field so much is because I wanted to get a scholarship and also through track and field, I was able to get a, um, a benefit through early registration because biology was impacted at my school. Had I not done track and field, I probably wouldn't have been able to acquire the classes that I desired. However, doing a very physical sport like this uh, and having to go to conferences and such takes a lot of time, especially when you're working with a very difficult field. Um, but that, that's one of the ways I was able to get the classes that I needed in my undergraduate. Um, go to the next slide. I think I have another thing. Um, when I came into marine biology, I actually didn't know how to dive. I didn't, I never, scuba dive until I graduated from my undergraduate. I was 23 when I first um, put on the gear and got into the water. So I was very afraid. I, I, I live down in California, and despite what they show you on TV, California is mostly a desert in Southern California. We're not supposed to have all that grass lawns. We're not supposed to have uh, you know non-native plant species everywhere littering our lawns and taking so much water. So I didn't really get to be in the water that much until I actually graduated. Before that, I just was made it waded in, but I never even scuba dive until I came here. And you know, I was actually ben benefited by the fact that we had um, an academic diving program here for the graduate students and undergraduates that helped me learn the skills that I needed. Nice. <laughs> I'd love to participate in something like that. Oh, I cannot wait to get out there and go scuba diving. Once I do, I'm going to have to contact you, Jackson, and fly out and dive somewhere yeah, else. I can tell you where the good spots are. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll take you up on that offer. I think you have you have one more slide for this question. Right, I do. Um, financial support was very difficult. Um, college is expensive and it's becoming increasingly more expensive. Now, in my undergraduate, there's a point where I thought that I might not be able to continue my um, my education, and I was I was fortunate enough for a um, for a program on my campus to be able to fund me while I did research with them. And even at the graduate level, I was able to find that as well. Um, you see that the graduate level one and the, um, the undergraduate one is mostly based around minorities. It brings minorities together so that it helps build that community that, you know, despite the difficulties of 
college and the financial cost, there's also the added impact of looking around and not seeing anyone who looks like you. And these helped me get through that dramatically. Um, back in California, they're mostly scientists. But in Florida, it was mostly PhD students from all across the state who had different um, who had different backgrounds, majors, programs, goals, careers, and such. Um, I'm the only marine biologist in that picture, but all of those people are my friends and we share similar hardships and we can actually talk and form rapport and um, look out for each other by doing that. Making good relationships with people, yeah, definitely uh, helps one get through those kind of uh, you know hard times. And, um, you know, whether you're looking through the lens of being a student or you're looking at the 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 hard work our planet's gonna have to go through to get through something like climate change, the actions that we'll have to take as humans to, di to divert climate change. Um, amongst all of this, Jackson, what personally gives you hope to continue you know, moving forward? Well, not to sound too sentimental, but things like this. I think that um, within the United States, we have a lot of um, issues with how with science communication, with how science communication is. And I think that through programs like this, by speaking with people, by reaching out, by forming communities and trying to let people know that, hey, you know, you have a place here. Um, you can be within this field. You can't understand this and trying to elucidate some of these concepts to multiple people, no matter where they are or who they are, and make it accessible to everybody is one of the best things we can do raising awareness of these things is one of the best ways to to um to to nip these issues in the bud before we can um cure your illness you need to first be able to diagnose it and accept that it's there sure. it is one of the best feelings to to hear another scientist say that science communication is one of these ways that we bridge these gaps between you know the public and and the and, and scientists and researchers alike right Let's see. Oh, we have that picture there. Did you want to talk a little bit about that picture? Yes, yeah, so this is actually me meeting with some um, Jackson State University students who came down to Florida State and talking about my experience and what it's like. Um, you might have seen me in talking in the actual video that we had at the beginning, but I thought this picture was really important because um, you know a lot of us will come together in order to get this information across to people. We do not have this sort of competitive, or at least I don't believe in this sort of competitive, I want to make sure that I'm the one at the top, I'm the only one who's here, I'm the pioneer of this field. That's not really how science works. It's a very collaborative field. And by um, focusing on the collaboration, focusing on the communication, focusing on the interdisciplinary work that we have with other people and, and um, coming together in order to solve these big issues, because we can't solve them on our own, is one of the best things we can do. And after this, I actually gave them a tour of the um, of the lab that we're actually in, because um, it's important to let people know what's available, what opportunities there are out there. Because a lot of times there are opportunities like those more programs that I showed you and the McKnight program that I showed you, but we're just not being made aware of them. Jackson, do you, do you think that you know science is becoming more representative? Is it becoming more of a topic that we conclude in our day to day lives? I think that it is. I think that science is, you know, science is everywhere. Science isn't some sort of tool that, it's, that I mean, I don't want to say a science is some sort of like belief system that you use to understand something. Science is a, like almost like a philosophy that you use to understand the world around you with new discoveries. Our explanation for what our field is like will change. And so I think that that's really big. Um, I think that it is very much becoming more for, on the forefront. You know, we have Discovery Channel. A lot of people tune in that. We have nature documentaries. That's really great. Um, and they seem to be, I think that in my personal experience, that they seem to be getting a little more popular. And when it comes to representation within science, um, there have been a lot of efforts made within, you know, you know ethnic minorities, within, um, you, know, just, you know, gender lines. Um, historically, women have had different have had difficulties in science, but there's been a lot of efforts to um, to address the fact that um, that they are just, you know, everyone can be a scientist no matter who you are, what your background is, where you where you came from, and there's always an opportunity to keep learning. I don't know everything. Nobody knows that everything, and if they do think they know everything, they don't know everything. So um, there's always more to learn, and it should be such that everyone can come in and um, 
I think we're starting to see larger efforts to address representation within science now more than ever. Thank you so much, Jackson. Everyone can be a scientist no matter who you are. Jackson Powell, thank you so much. Uh, round of applause. Thank you so much for you know participating in today's event. You were able to share some, some very critical information and uh, hopefully there's a young black student in this audience that you're able to inspire. Inspire everyone, truly. Your work is uh, stands for itself and we really appreciate you coming on to uh, Earth Echo and of course our scientists in Ever Florida School participating in an event like this. It's truly meaningful. Um, now, everyone watching, you can definitely take action to protect biodiversity, like Jackson and I have been discussing, to protect biodiversity in your own backyard with Earth Echo's Our Echo Challenge. And of, of course, we're able to take a look at this video. I'm Philippe Cousteau, and I'm so excited to announce that Earth Echo International's Our Echo Challenge is open for entries. Over the last 40 years, 50% of the biodiversity on Earth has been lost. This presents an enormous threat to the future of our planet. And the Our Echo Challenge is a national program that empowers students to do something about it, to protect and restore biodiversity, and crucially, get the funding to do it. The Our Echo Challenge empowers teams of middle school students to explore their community, identify threats to local species, and then submit an idea for a project that will help to restore a healthy ecosystem. 10 finalist teams will join Earth Echo International to present their ideas, and the top three teams will be awarded grants to turn their projects into a reality. Teachers and educators, go to www.ourechochallenge.org and register your team to join our STEM competition and submit your plans to change the world. And hold on one second, we're having a little difficulties. Armand, can you go ahead and unmute your mic? Are you able to hear me now? Happens all the time. <laughs> All righty, but thank you so much, uh, Casey, for the reminder. I was mentioning that, yeah, that Earth Echo, our, uh, our Echo Challenge, um, help us take action to protect biodiversity in your own backyards. And if you are a middle school teacher, middle school teachers, um, we invite middle school teachers to join us for a virtual expedition to go into and beyond the dead zone. Using Earth Echo's Academy, teachers will be able to broaden their students' knowledge of this global problem and, and gain more insight and resources on how to really guide your students' understanding and inspire some action. Uh, this is really a four-week professional development course. It provides content on uh, environmental storytelling and literacy, environmental justice, and, and more. So register today, and the course begins March 30th, 2021, Middle School Teachers. And of course, we want to make sure to put in a plug in here to be sure to stay connected with Earth Echo as well as scientists in every Florida school on social media. Visit our websites here to find out more information about all of our exciting programs, including upcoming virtual events just like the one you participated in today. And before you sign off YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you can tune into more of this information that we've got for you all. Last but not least, we want to make sure to thank our amazing e event participant today, our special guest, Jackson Powell. Um, and on behalf of Earth Echo International and scientists at every Florida school and myself, thank you all so much for joining us today. Stay safe. Have a good one.